All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and today my co-host is my brother, the Gritty Broman. How are you, Brent? I'm well, thank you. You don't sound well. No, I've been I've been dying <laughs> a slow death for the last week and a half. Uh, you sound like you're a bit, bit under the weather. Got a little head cold, but, you know, Dayquil and Red Bull, you know, you can power through <laughs> most problems with those two things. Well, what about Yeti mode? Uh, I... <laughs> So since the last time we podcasted, I ended up going to the gym and taking some Yeti mode, and I ended up sharing my Yeti mode with an individual who has recently stopped doing meth in the last couple months, and he uh, he said meth sometimes has a smaller kick than that. <laughs> Come on. I love Yeti mode myself. I uh, loved it too, but you got to admit that the yeah, heart pumping is a little alarming. It's, it's the niacin rush and stuff. Uh, if, you, if you want something with a little kick... Folks, uh, use the code Gritty over at Mountain Ops and get yourself some ye- of the new Yeti mode. Um, I like it. Uh, I like the uh, – when I go work out, I like to feel that way. Some people don't. It may not be for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're sensitive to caffeine or stimulants, this will destroy your soul. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's not for the faint <laughs> of heart. It's not like you should definitely try Yeti. And if Yeti works good for you, leave it alone. <laughs> You know, but if you take Yeti and you, you're yeah. that person that gets acclimated, you need to bump it up to the bigger boy. I like it. But, boy, uh, folks, we are back. We are back with uh, the River of Doubt uh, with uh, Theodore Roosevelt. We left off where Kermit um, killed the man. Well, indirectly, I suppose. Uh, Simplicio, is that was his name? Sim- Simplicio? He was drowned. Uh, and so he died as Kermit made a foolish choice to try to. He ignored uh, Captain Rondon, and he went... Ignored a direct command. And then he went out to the island where he thought he could look across and see. And and this, by the way, is good for us outdoorsmen to consider because it is it is quite dangerous. Some of these, like, quick... We, talked, we touched on this on the last episode. Some of this stuff is quite dangerous because it only takes a little momentary lapse that you think is minor. Like, let's just float over to that island and then we'll just float back. And um, ended up costing a man his life and that cost him their boat and everything else. So I, I wanted to know what Simplicio means. And it's Italian in origin. Oh, yeah? And it, it, the meaning is someone who is spiritually blessed. <laughs> well, up until that <laughs> moment, I mean... It was a good ride up until then. Yeah, I mean, it's sad. And, and so... But it, like I said, um, you can be climbing a mountainside like Lampers and I in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. You can be floating across a river like we did on a on a on a wild mountain hunt, making the the wrong choice. Just saying, oh, I'll just scooch across this thousand foot drop, you know, on this ledge, uh, <laughs> and I'll be fine. Like without little, a rope, little or moments any like yeah, little decisions like that that seem you really ought to for weigh the consequences of if things go cat, cat, uh, catastrophically wrong and then account for those and work around them because too often we don't we don't do that mm-hmm. uh, crossing a log with a heavy backpack on even though the water's only waist deep but it's flowing really hard you mm-hmm. know can you get out of that backpack if you fell in and got s- s- mm-hmm. sucked under a log or something or you know little things that can you just too often we're like well I wouldn't slip Mm-hmm. And so that's what, or I'll just swim. It's Lampers. Fine. I'll just swim the five feet. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Lampers has given me that lecture all the time. Uh, <laughs> Crossing the log, you know, all the dangerous stuff. I probably am less risk averse than him. But um, anyway, that's that's where we're at. Before we jump into this episode, I want to uh, ask you guys to check out Goat Knives. If you are in need of a knife, they are a partner of ours. Um, Travis Nowatney over there. You can see a little dirty. that one's hammered. <laughs> um, I like. I actually like this one right here. Yeah, I like that one, which doesn't have the detachable blade. But I, I like them both. But I'm I'm finding that I I really do like the fact that it's all one solid piece. Mm-hmm. I think this is the carbon tur or something. I I never. I'm horrible with names, but both knives are legit. Um, I like the metal because it's just the right amount of metal. Um, for for sharpening um, and not being too mm-hmm. hard, but but a hard enough steel that it holds its edge. So 
Uh, my other one of my other favorite knives is the Benchmade Altitude, mm -hmm. similar. and it it has a similar sheath where it hangs around my neck like this. But the Altitude, it's a tiny bit light lighter weight, but it is it is um, you can't sharpen it without a professional sharpener. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a couple of friends who who will do that for me on occasion. But once it's dull, it's dull, and there is no sharpening that on your own. Mm -hmm. um, Unless you own like a, Nitro what is it called? V. A wicked sharpener or something? Or oh, wicked edge. Wicked edge sharpener. Yeah. So anyway, check that out, folks. Go to uh, Gritty. Uh, use the code Gritty Goat over at Goat Knives. I highly recommend these knives and the replaceable blade knives that uh, that they sell over there. And then, uh, as always, check out Peaks. Peaks Equipment. Use the code Gritty over there for some trekking poles, gators, or the new headlamp. Although the headlamp is sold out at the moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, which is awesome. But um, use the code Gritty over there, and then use the code Gritty over at Mountain Ops. Get yourself some Ignite, some Yeti, Yeti Mode, or those Blaze Shots. They're all good. All right. All right. <clears throat> Let's get into this. Um, I'm going to hop right in, Brent, to uh, this harrowing expedition. For those that haven't heard the rest of this, you know, or just coming onto this podcast for the first time, this is a series. I think this is like episode 10 or something. Nine, seven, I don't know. But uh it's a it's a this is a series where we're reading from this book about Theodore Roosevelt going through the Amazon jungle on an uncharted river called the River of Doubt. That night, after the men, now numbering only twenty one, had finished their portage around the last waterfall, they retired to their tents and hammocks. Hunched over his small table, Roosevelt acknowledged in the article he was writing that his son had had a very narrow escape. Had they lost Kermit rather than Simplicio that day, he wrote, he did not think he could have borne the pain of bringing bad tidings to his betrothed because Kermit's married or, or engaged, I should say. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, Theodore Roosevelt says he, he doesn't think he could bring that news to his mother and to his fiance, basically. So he writes that in his journal. Kermit's near drowning had been a result of the young man's own recklessness, but Roosevelt felt a a uh, heavy weight of responsibility for having chosen to descend this dangerous river and for having brought his son along with him. Although Kermit had joined the expedition in order to protect his father, Roosevelt's mission from this point onward would be to protect Kermit and to ensure that he made it out of the rainforest alive. <laughs> Good luck. <clears throat> yeah, no doubt. Um, Having faced his own mortality and having caused, albeit indirectly, another man's death, Kermit showed no signs of remorse or even any sense of responsibility when he scribbled a brief account of the day's events in his journal that night. <laughs> he recorded the, the fact of Simplicio's death as tersely and unemotionally as he did his own near drowning. Simplicio was drowned, he wrote. If he felt sorrow for Simplicio's death or regret for his own rash decision to cross to the other side of the river when Rondon had warned him not to... He did not uh, admit it in his diary, nor did he appear to have any desire to change his ways. If Roosevelt had hoped that, th that this tragedy had driven some degree of fear or even caution into his son, he was to be disappointed. All right. Jeez, Kermit. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, what do you think about that? I don't know. In a lot of ways, I can't. It's not like he forced them to do anything. You know, it's not like he was like, get in the boat. Come on, let's go. He kind of gave him orders. They, they, they balked. We didn't want to do it. He was the one in charge, though. At least they felt so. Yeah, and I don't really see what the reason was. Like, they could have just hung out and waited. You know, I, I, get, I understand the urgency. You're running out of food. You're trying mm -hmm. to get down the river as quickly as you can and stuff. We know Kermit is super eager to get his father out of the jungle. He's worried about, and him. he's got a girl back home, bro. Yeah, like, he's got a bunch of other yeah. things he wants to do. the The impetuousness of youth is shining through. I think also the invincibility that young men seem to think they have mm -hmm. is shining through as well. I I look at this. Um, Kermit is just fiercely independent. Mm -hmm. Like he and and um, the, he, he everything is his own fault. Like, like, or, or I should say that he, he is like, he feels very independent and he'll take care of himself. And he, he's not, no one is obligated to save him or take care of him. That's mm -hmm. his approach to life. When you read personality pro profiles about people like that, Lampers is like that. Yeah. Uh, they have a personality that's like, 
they take they take care of business and they get things done and they 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 have a, a fierce independence and they don't tell really necessarily tell other people what to do but they don't get told what to do either mm-hmm. they tend to have an a, a a really strong drive to be on their own and i think um <clears throat> when when someone does something and they they fail a personality like that doesn't feel responsible for your failure that's your failure mm-hmm. not not theirs like they wouldn't expect you to feel responsible for their failure and so they don't feel responsible for your failure. Yeah, but in this particular case, failure is someone died. You he know. should have swam better. <laughs> or he should have done this or should have yeah. done that like that. You can't, you know, it's just a tragic, it happened. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't, you wish it wouldn't, but it just did, you know. Um, I think that uh, when faced with mortality, like when someone actually dies like that, I think young people especially, they tend to... Um, not want to face it Mm -hmm. because I think you're, you're facing your own mortality. And that's something that a lot of people want to pretend isn't a thing. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to die someday. It's not, it's not an if it's Mm -hmm. a, it's a guarantee. People don't want to dwell on that because it comes with a whole bunch of other things. Like, why am I here? And what do I need to do with life? And what, what, what's the whole point of all that? Like all these other can of worms come out when you start, Delving into, that. yeah, when you're faced with mortality. So I think uh, young people tend to sidestep it quite a bit uh, and avoid the topic altogether if possible. Like my kids, when they watch a movie where someone dies, like and it's a core part of the movie, they're just like, they have no interest in that movie anymore. They're, they feel but wronged and betrayed that it even got shown to them. You know, it makes me think of that episode of the friend on friends uh-huh. when they're like, you didn't cry during Bambi. <laughs> and Chandler's like, it was very sad when the artist stopped drawing the deer. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think that like the young people, I know when I was young too, if I saw a movie that, that had an ending where you were faced with mortality and death. I'm like, yeah, I could just watch something else, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, anyway, it's an interesting, he doesn't even dwell on it much. Um, and now he feels responsible for Roosevelt and Roosevelt feels responsible for Kermit. And they're both like kind of concerned about the other having faced his own mortality and having caused, albeit indirectly another man's death. He showed no signs of remorse or any sense of responsibility when he scribbled a brief account in the day's events in his journal that night. I don't know that that means anything, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't put what they think or feel on paper, especially Mm -hmm. private people. Um, who knows really what was going on there with, uh, Kermit. Someone will probably call him racist. The man who seemed to be most shaken by what had happened that day was Cherry. Having spent half his life traveling through South American jungles, he understood the gravity of the situation better than did Kermit or Roosevelt, and he was more concerned about surviving the journey than was Rondon. Although he regretted Simplicio's death, he was much more disturbed by the fact that they had lost Kermit's dugout and most of its cargo. The loss of a human life is always a tragedy, he wrote, but the loss of the canoe and its contents was an even greater tragedy to the remaining members of our party. In his last letter home, and I don't think that's callous. I think that's just real, right? It's practical. Practical. You got to yeah. survive. And it's like, yes, we lost a person, but we might lose everybody, everybody because yeah. of this. Um, in his last letter home, which he had written the day before they launched their boats on the river, Cherry had told his wife, Stella, that he hoped to be back in Vermont in time to help sow the spring crops at Rocky Dell. We may reach New York by the end of... Uh, end of May, he had written. I hope we we shall for, I hope we shall for. I would like very much to be able to help get in the potatoes and other crops. He realized now, however, that if he was ever going to see his family or Rocky Dell again, the expedition could not afford any more losses like the ones they had suffered that day. Hmm. Rondon, although angry that Kerman's disobedience had cost him the life of one of his men, was neither shocked by Simplicio's death nor deterred by it nor deterred by it. Certainly no one uh, commences an enterprise of the kind in which we were engaged without having previously become acquainted with the idea of the danger, which same may offer and of the innumerable occasions in which one has to face death. He wrote 
For Rondon, death was merely one of the many costs of achieving a much larger goal that had already cost the lives of countless of his men. Opening the country's interior and integrating the Amazon's native peoples into Brazilian society. Few Brazilians, including many of Rondon's soldiers, shared his passion for contacting and befriending Indians or even believed that such a thing was possible. Backed by a number of local civilians, his men resented the sacrifices that they were expected to make in the name of their commander's ideals. At one point, a group of rubber plantation owners wrote to the Brazilian newspaper, A. Cruz, that Rondon lets his soldiers die of hunger while distributing food to the savages. In the most remote reaches of the Amazon, however, Rondon was unreachable and unstoppable. He had never allowed his men's suffering or even their deaths to affect his work in the wilderness, and he never would. Death and dangers, in spite of how much suffering they bring, he wrote, should not interfere with the expedition's mission. Hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, like the risks you have to take in life. Mm-hmm. Like if you have a goal and you want to do something, there's just innate risks involved and you have to accept those as you go forward. Mm-hmm. But that's a little hardcore. He's just like, I feel like Ron Doan's like guy dies left, guy dies right. Keep going. Well, that's the thing. I think when you grow up in a world where people die all the time, constantly, that's just part of existence. You're, you're a little more numb to it and you're, you're reconciled to it as well. And so life has meaning, though, in the pursuit of this goal and this higher purpose. You have to have some meaning in the face of such tragedy. And for Rondon, it's, it's the, the meaning he's finding is in this, this mission to integrate and bring Brazil together and to bring the native people around and, mm-hmm. and progress, right? And the fact that people are going to die on this, that's just a given, and I think that's part of what Kermit's attitude is too. Look, no one made you come on this expedition. This is the cost of doing expeditions. You die, right? And I think that all these men kind of went into this knowing this for the most part, and they accepted that. They were, they were, they were well prepared for what happens, and they just move on when it happens. Mm-hmm. Think about it. If you go on this expedition, you're like, okay, there's there's 20 of us, 10 are going to die. When when, some, when someone dies, you're like, yep, that's what I thought. Mm-hmm. Like your expectations are set. Like it's just expected. When it happens, you're not freaking out about it because you knew that when you went there. You're just hoping you're one of the ones that pull through. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's like when, you know, people were moving across the West, the Western frontier. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, I want to find a homestead and start a family and all that. Or I could get murdered by a marauding, group of bandits or natives or whatever it's like you roll the dice and you hope you're one of those that squeaks through but if you do get shot up with 25 arrows or eaten by a grizzly bear you're like well i knew that was a potential uh result of my choices you you just you you go in with the people just aren't cool like that anymore well we are just spoiled nowadays Mm -hmm. the next morning march 16 the men woke awoke ready to face the river once again while the rain fell heavily in the still dark forest they gathered around rondon to listen to his orders of the day as a representative of the of the brazilian government rondon uh, perpetuated the name of the unfortunate simplicio by officially naming for him the waterfall that had ended his young life simplicio was unmarried so rondon and roosevelt agreed that if they survived this journey they would send the money that he would have earned to his mother. Unable to do anything more for the young man who had lost his life for their ambition, they carved a short inscription on one side of their camp marker. In these rapids died poor Simplicio. And solemnly, they walked away. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that they had another, that they had another hard and dangerous day ahead of them. The day before, during their desperate search for Simplicio, they had found another series of rapids downstream, even worse than the ones that had drowned the camp camarada. Further complicating the situation was the fact that now they now had 21 men in only five canoes and none of the trees near their camp were suitable material for dugout. Some of the men would have to walk. At 7 a.m. in a blinding rain, Kermit climbed into the expedition's large new canoe and set off ahead of the rest of the boats, just as he had for the past two and a half weeks. After only half an hour on the river, the men reached the rapids that they had known awaited them. As Kermit had already explored the left side of the river in his search for Simplicio, 
Rondon and Lyra paddled to the right side, where they found a channel and circumvented the worst part of the rapids. Luis and Antonio Carrera, the expedition's two best watermen, were then charged with the job of lowering the empty dugouts by ropes from the right bank. At the same time, the rest of the camaradas would begin cutting a half-mile-long portage road along the left bank of the baggage carry. Having satisfied himself that all of his men were suitably engaged in useful work, Rondon took his favorite dog, Lobo, and set off over a hill just behind their camp in the hope of finding game or falling or failing that Brazil nuts. Hmm. Solo Lobo. <laughs> <clears throat> Although the rest of the men rarely left camp alone, especially after they saw the abandoned Indian village and found the uh, Pataran. Rondon was at ease when he was on his own. He was, and always has been, a loner. He had found his own way in the world, the first as an orphan and then as an outsider at the military academy in Rio de Janeiro. After he had married, he had been separated for long periods of time and by hundreds of miles from his wife and children. Francisca Rondon had suffered as much as any of her husband's soldiers over the past 22 years. She had been raised as a sheltered city girl in Rio de Janeiro, the daughter of one of Rondon's professors at the military school. But soon after she married, she had left that life behind, moving to remote Mato Grosso to be closer to Candido. Since then, she had given birth to seven children, Dang. endured isolation and illness, including malaria and yaws, an infectious tropical disease that attacks the skin and bones, and been forced to carry on without her husband for months and even years at a time. She finally taught herself telegraphic code so that she could send brief messages to him while he was in the field. On their ninth wedding anniversary, anniversary in February 1901, Rondon had sent her a wistful telegram. This day brings us sweet remembrances of the past. Let us accept our sad life. Miss you deeply. Embraces Candido. <laughs> hey, he's a romantic at heart. That, that's right there. That's proof. <laughs> Let us remember the past and let us accept our sad life. I miss you. <laughs> Woo. He's got away with words. Yeah, that's rough. Um, in the field, surrounded by hundreds of men, Rondon had found his job as commander to be a lonely and friendless one. But for a handful of close confidants, such as Lyra and Am 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 Amilcar, Rondon's only companionship had come from his dogs. At times, he had as many as 20 dogs in his camp. Jeez. And he always had a favored pack of three or four that were constantly by his side. They did not complain or mutiny, and they were cheerful, trustworthy, and devoted to their master. There was no question that Rondon cared more for these dogs than he did for his own men, or that he worried about their safety and comfort. He showed them with, uh, he showered them with affection, shared his food with them, and on one occasion even halted a march so that they could rest. On another march, he had carried one of his dogs in his arms so that he would not die of exhaustion. Although he rarely devoted more than a single sentence in his journal to the death of one of his men, Rondon penned heartfelt eulogies to his dogs. After his dog, uh, Volcao, died, for instance, he wrote, Travel companion who guarded my tent, poor companion, how I feel your death, you who served me so well without being able to pay your back, pay you without being able to pay you back for half of your dedication. Now, contentedly walking through the forest with faithful Lobo at his side, Rondon turned north after cresting the hill behind the expedition's camp and headed back in the direction of the River of Doubt. After following the river about a mile downstream, he came to a point at which a narrow canal split off from the main waterways. Making his way through the tangle of trees and vines along the canal, Rondon suddenly heard the unmistakable quavering whinny of the Coata, or spider monkey. Ew. The largest primate in the Amazon rainforest. Brent, what do those look like? Taking a thousand precautions so that he would not frighten the monkeys, Rondon crouched down in the thick vegetation and slowly made his way toward the sound. As he scanned the tree's highest branches, where he knew the spider monkey lived, he could imagine his men's delight when he walked into camp holding a 20-pound spider monkey by its dark, long tail. Yeah, just really big, lanky, black monkeys. Hmm. They're spidery looking. Like skinny with long, long, long legs and arms. That's Kinda the biggest cute. rainforest primate is what it said. 
Something like that. Um, 20 pound. The largest primate in the rainforest is the spider monkey. I bet they're just mean as hell to other monkeys. Oh, bro. But they're just eating their brains. and Their monkeys. hands are bigger than their faces. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, okay, so he's walking along, sneaking up on these spider monkeys. The forest was typically... Wow. That's pretty cool. It's that is up. a long tail. It's a really so long tail. So that tail is pretensile then. Mm-hmm. Because it, it's holding on like a possum tail would or something. Yeah, that's a long tail. It's so for those that can't see, there's this monkey on a branch over a river, and it's hanging on strictly by its tail, and it's dipping water. Like to drink, like out of its hand. I don't know if you can see that on the screen. I'll airdrop it and just put it over the video. That's wild. That's gnarly. So uh, he says, um, um, the forest was typically quiet, and Rondon did his best not to snap branches or rustle leaves as he crept through the underbrush. Excited by the hunt, Lobo sprinted ahead of his master and quickly disappeared from view. Moments later, the silence was rent by a high-pitched yelp. Certain that Lobo had been attacked by an animal, a jaguar, or perhaps a peccary, Rondon braced himself for the worst. Then he heard something even more bone-chilling, the sound of human voices. These were well known to me, he would later recall. They were short exclamations, energetic and repeated in a kind of chorus, with a certain cadence peculiar to Indians who, when they are ready for the fight, commence the attack on the enemy. At that moment, Rondon was the enemy. He had no protection beyond his rifle and the cover of the rainforest. His only hope was to remain as invisible to the Indians as they were to him. Silently, Lobo reappeared, staggering toward his master and giving way, giving away Rondon's hiding place. As the dog drew near, Rondon could see two long arrows protruding from his side. In desperation, with the Indians' war cries ringing in his ear, Rondon raised his rifle and fired into the air. The blast shook the leaves around him and put startled animals to flight, but the Indians kept coming. Although Rondon still could not see Lobo's attackers, he could hear them clearly, chattering excitedly to one another from the dense cover of the rainforest. He fired his other barrel, but the war hoops continued, finally realizing that he could not defend himself against certain attack. Colonel Rondon turned and fled. Hmm. <clears throat> That's, um, creepy. Yeah. You got to imagine what those things sound like. What? Not those things. Those people. Those people <laughs> in the bush. That's got to sound freaky. Yeah. Because sure. they're not going to be speaking a language you know, and they're going to be making war cries and all sorts of weird noises. Um, he found the rest of the men at the foot of the rapids where he, where he had established the expedition's camp earlier that morning. Gathering his officers together, he told them what had happened. Their worst fear had been realized. The Indians that lived on the River of Doubt were no longer ghosts. They were real, and they were prepared to attack. The others had alarming news of their own. While Rondon was gone, they had lost another canoe. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> Louise and Antonio Correa had successfully brought one of the dugouts down the channel. But as they were lowering the large canoe that they had built themselves just a few days earlier, the rope had broken and the canoe had been swept into a colony of boulders. Louise had almost been swept away with it. The other camaradas had managed to save him, but they had not been able to save the canoe or the ropes and pulleys that it had carried. But there was no supplies in it, though. Correct. Rondon was deeply concerned about the loss of the new dugout, but the Indians worried him more. Turning to Lyra and Kermit, Lyra and Kermit, he asked them to return with him to the scene of the attack. They agreed, and taking Dr. Kajazira and Antonio Paresi with them, immediately they set out to retrace Rondon's steps. They just agreed readily. Yeah, <laughs> sure. We'll go back to the scene of the attack. <clears throat> well, um, yeah. Rondon has a way with words. Mm. That's what I'm, you know. I'm thinking in Portuguese, it comes out much more eloquently. Be honest. Are you going back for the dog? No. <laughs> no, the dog had two arrows in its side. You're in the middle of the rainforest. Like, and not only that, but you know those arrows are tipped with something. <laughs> <laughs> They're not just like a regular arrow. They probably dipped in poop or some kind some of poison. poison. Yeah. You know, like, <clears throat> no. Yeah, I say you stay with the big group and you get back in what boats you got. Or you get just you get the hell out of Dodge yeah, at this bro, point. Yeah, bro, yeah. Peace out. <laughs> uh, all right. <clears throat> 
so um yeah so they go back to the scene of the crime um where was i at uh da, 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 da. by the time the five men reached the canal the indians had vanished lucky them the men discovered a few items that they had left behind however including a small basket filled with animal entrails and tied to a long rod rondon guessed that the basket had been used for fishing the Indians, he thought, must have lowered it into the river, waited for fish to swim in, over to the bait, and then speared them with their with their arrows. Hmm. Kneeling down, he placed some gifts, a couple of axes, and a few beads next to the basket, a gesture he hoped would send the message that not only did he and his men not want to be the Indians' enemies, but they hoped to be their friends. Someone's going to end up with an axe in their back. <laughs> Scanning the forest, the men found a rough trail that had led across the canal and had clearly been the Indian's path of retreat. Then Rondon found another, more grisly trail, drops of blood smeared on leaves and dripped on branches. He followed the bloody trail for about 300 yards until at its end he found Lobo. The dog had tried to make his way back to camp but had finally collapsed. The arrows that had killed him still protruded from his small body. One had struck his left leg and torn away the muscle. The other had entered his stomach just below his heart. Yeah. The arrow had been launched with such force that it had been driven completely through his body and its blood-stained tip emerged from the other side. Looking down at Lobo, no one could have any doubt that the Indian's intent had been to kill and that uh, had Rondon walked into the ambush first, it would have been his body rather than Lobo's that lay in a pool of blood on the forest floor. Mm. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. I mean, that's kind of jumping to conclusions. Like, maybe they would have just been like, oh, wait, that's a person that looks different than us. Maybe. Maybe, maybe we don't kill I, I see a couple <laughs> scenarios here. One, probably, I don't think these people have seen a dog before, probably. I don't think dogs are. Are they native to South America? Um, the rainforest dog, coyote type. There's got to be some kind of some canid kind of... that lives there in the rainforest. Um, I'm not a rainforest expert, but um, there's got to be like a wolf. At like this a... point, we might be considered experts. <laughs> I mean, we've been doing this long enough. Um, rain, Amazon rainforest. Forest canine. Let's see if anything pops yeah. up. Yeah. There's a short eared dog. I mean, like, Dude, that is ugly. It, that's a weasel, bro. <laughs> look at that. That's a dang weasel. It looks kind of like a. Uh, doesn't it yeah. look to you like a? Um, kind of like a uh, one of those critters from uh, Australia. Um, a dingo. A little dingo-ish. Oh, that thing is. It looks it's, mousy. It, it, it looks kind of like. Um, why am I drawing a blank here? The the little whirlwind. Um, oh, Tasmanian Devil. Tasmanian Devil. You like how I picked that up from nothing? <laughs> <laughs> the little whirlwind. You know, the whirlwind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no sound effects. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> don't tell me that wasn't a solid clue. <laughs> it kind of does. Doesn't but it? It looks very weasel or Look ferret. The, I don't, it looks freakish. I've never seen anything that looks like it. Because look how those ears look at the are ears shaped. are like skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Folks, this is a strange looking. Look at that. That's a dog? Huh. We're going to drop lots of pictures on this. That looks that looks interesting. What was it called? Short-eared, short-eared dog. No. Yeah, is that what it's called? Yeah, short-eared. short-eared also dog. known as... Short eared Zorro. Zorro. That's <laughs> it's the shorter eared Zorro or folks. a short eared jackal. Okay, that's what it looks like. More like a jackal, which is what a Tasmanian devil kind of looks like as well. Mm-hmm. It does look kind of jackal ish, but very it also looks like a chihuahua, like a hairless chihuahua kind of. I don't, I don't know. know. It has very. Its hair looks like a rodent's hair. Okay, like, so your theory is is you know wrong. They probably. Had seen something. Dog-ish. I don't know, dude. That that <laughs> that thing looks freaky <laughs> as hell. That look. Look at the tail. That it, looks it, like it looks like a fur bearer tail. You know what I mean? It looks like a raccoon tail. Yeah, on a dog. Or, yeah, for real. That's and weird. They, they have like naked mole rat ears. Mm-hmm. They are not a handsome creature. <laughs> that's for sure. Dude, the Amazon's freakish. That's it a looks fox. like a cat dog. 
cat yeah. dog. Anyway, we're, 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 let's get back to so the So my theory here. is this. They uh-huh. either saw the dog, freaked Definitely out. Definitely doesn't look like that dog. No. So, no. yeah, they probably haven't seen anything like it. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if Rondon came out, he's going to be just as alien. True. I mean, perhaps. But, uh, and I don't think, I'm pretty sure these people are like protein <laughs> with either one of these. <laughs> The dog or Rondon. Like, I, whatever came out of that right. bush was going to get stuck. Coulda, coulda, coulda. All right. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, despite his sorrow and fear, Rondon refused to abandon his principles. These melancholic reflections, he wrote, did not divert me away from my habitual norm of conducting right, uh, of, let me start over. These melancholic reflections, he wrote, did not divert me away from my habitual norm of conduct regarding the Indians. He had faced hostile Indians before, and he would likely do so again. And he was more worried about alienating them than dying at their hands. The man's ready to die. He's just like, take me anytime. I know. You know, like, whatever. Um, I mean, you can't deny it. Like, there's a nobility in this guy that's intense. I mean, like, he's got some principles and he sticks to them, and there's definitely something very noble about that. The principle itself I find questionable. <laughs> uh, Rondon had uh, long argued that the Indians attacked only when forced to do so. In fact, he claimed that 90% of the Indian attacks that took place in Brazil were nothing more than acts of self defense and retaliation. I don't buy that shit at all. Like, uh, that, that oh. I don't buy at all. Only because this is what I don't like this kind of situation um, uh, in general where. People romanticize a certain group of human beings. Yes, because he definitely romanticizes the Indians over his own men. Well, here's the, the, the deal. I, I, human beings are human beings, period, the end. You have good ones, you have bad ones. Mm-hmm. You have people who are noble and you have people who are evil. And it doesn't have to do with their color or their ethnicity or any. you have good and you have bad and the line of good and evil runs through every human heart. And so the idea that... Uh, there's not some um, mean Indians who just rape and murder for the hell of it. If there's some in every wa- every ethnic group of human beings, they exist in this group as well. Mm-hmm. But you, you can generalize and say, on the whole, that's not very common. On the whole, you have pretty decent group. Of, these are pretty decent folks. And on the whole over here, these people will kill you, you know, for $5, right? You can make that assessment, but... I just don't like this whole thing where he's like, what did he say? I guess he said 90% of the Indian attacks that took place in Brazil were nothing more than acts of self-defense and retaliation. Um, but he says, uh, he long argued that Indian attacks on, on, only, they, they were only happened when forced to do so. Um, again, uh, I've heard such things written about um, settlers coming across the West that they only attacked mm-hmm. in self-defense. You hear native people, the Cherokee or the Lakota saying they would only kill white people if, uh, if, XYZ. if for, for some noble reason, it's like humans are humans, dude. There, no, no human group of people is, is so pure that they don't do something heinous to another group. Mm-hmm. Um, People are individuals at the end of the day, regardless and of, of where they came from. And so what do they say? Like some 3% of the population or 1% is um, psychotic, mm. like um, murderous, you know, super violent. That's, that's across the board. Like it doesn't matter where you came from. And that exists in every group. Uh, there's always some crazies. Uh, so anyway. They the idea that Indians crazies. might attack the expedition for reasons of fear or self-defense offered little comfort to Roosevelt. I'm with Rosie. I'm, I'm with Theodore here. Um, the idea that Indians might attack the expedition for reasons of fear or self-defense, and that's the only reason they would do it, that's not very comforting. Mm-mm. Who noted Riley, if you are shot by a man because he is afraid of you, it is almost as unpleasant as if he shot you because he <laughs> wanted to kill you. Yeah. That's my thing, too. It's like, I don't really care about the reason why. The fact is... I got shot. I got shot. Yep. Um, And I think what I like about theater, and I relate to him here, is um, he doesn't have any particularly dislike for a certain group of people or a particular like in general. It's just like human beings can do 
heinous things. Mm-hmm. Um, this idea of saying this group is noble, like Rondon definitely admired and and sort of romanticized, I think, the native people. And I think that's a mistake. Don't don't romanticize any group of people. At the end of the day, people are people. Human beings, we all come from the same same basic fundamental DNA. And uh, we all have... We all have uh, within us the the ability to do good and to do tremendous evil, and that's mm-hmm. in every person. And if you don't think that that's true, or you don't think that you have the potential to become like that, you need to educate yourself. Mm-hmm. Read a book like Ordinary Men, or yeah. or you know, if you like the, what was it? Um, Jordan Peterson mentioned how <clears throat> when you read uh, a book like Man's Search for Meaning with Viktor Frankl. You'll find yourself putting your, you find yourself as you read it, putting yourself in the shoes of the victims instead of in the shoes of the perpetrators of the heinous acts at the camp. Mm-hmm. And he's like, why, why, why do you, why do you do that? Cause you're probably more likely to be the perpetrator than you were the victim. But we don't, we don't mm-hmm. think of ourselves that way. And we don't think we would, we would be the bad guy. And that's where it's important to actually do some real honest self-reflection. So it goes going on. It says, even Rondon was shaken by what he had found when he knelt down to get a closer look at the arrows that had impaled Lobo. Since the expedition had pa- uh, passed the abandoned village more than two weeks earlier, Rondon had assumed that the Indians that surrounded them in the rainforest were Nambakira, members of the tribe with whom he had made first contact seven years earlier. But as he examined these arrows, he realized that he was wrong. The arrow that had impaled Lobo had a point that was shaped like a barbed lance and was made from bamboo. This, Rondon knew, was not the work of the Nambiquara. The river, Duvi- the river Duvida, he concluded, was inhabited by a new tribe. The river Duvida is the river of doubt. Mm-hmm. The river of doubt, he concluded, was inhabited by a, a, a new tribe of Indians with regard to which we possessed no information. Which is not surprising. Like... <sighs> I remember we were looking up the stats of like how mm-hmm, many people mm-hmm. were there around this time. There's millions of people living yep. in this rainforest. Yep. And 98% of them have had no contact with outside people. Yeah. Or even with each other in mm-hmm. sense, like just the tribe that maybe borders them. Rondon did not know these Indians and they did not know him. There was not even the pretense of peace between them and the outside world. Rondon, moreover, could only assume that whoever these Indians were... They would defend their land as fiercely as the Namaquara had defended theirs. The critical difference was that he had been able to retreat after being attacked by the Namaquara. Now retreat was impossible. In fact, in order to survive, they would have to go deeper into the territory of this unknown tribe, a land where they now knew with certainty they were not welcome. They're going to get shot. They killed his dog. I was going to say, man, like he's not, he did, he's not like out for revenge. Lobo's dead. And uh, he's like, leave them gifts. <laughs> yeah, he's got, I, I, like I said earlier, like I get his, uh, his morals that he's sticking to. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. applaudable. But I question them very deeply. Theodore doesn't. <laughs> at all like they're totally different minded people um theodore has no interest in rather dying than fighting an indian mm-hmm. um he doesn't find that as uh he's not a noble death to him no no there's nothing else like he doesn't admire them to the point of that at all um he just thinks they're another group of people um mm-hmm. and uh if it comes down to it me or you i'm gonna take, take you me. out yep and yeah. Rondon is so peaceful with the Indians that he would just take a knife to the chest and do nothing and die rather than provoke an attack on them. Yeah, I'm in Theodore's boat on this one. <laughs> I'm no pacifist myself. No. <laughs> no. Uh, I got yeah. a family to get back but, to. But, I mean, it's brave. I mean, it is. Uh, Rondon has his, uh, I mean, that takes some serious um, convictions and, and uh, strength of character to do what he It's not where my convictions does. lie. So... Anyway, all right. So that was that was it for that chapter. Uh, the next chapter, the wide belts. Um, we'll get into that. Uh, where's the murder? Hunger. Hunger. 
Did we read the murder? No. We're not there not yet. yet. Let me see here. I will stop here. Look at this this river here. It's freakish. We're looking at the pictures in the book, and they're just like... I can't believe they have photographs of this expedition. Like, who how brought did they the keep camera? the camera? Uh, look at that. I mean, that's Kermit. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, look at the float in that river. I mean, just how lucky were they, they managed to keep the camera through all this? I don't know. I don't know if this camera was early in the expedition, but it looks. It can't be that early. Look at Kermit. This dude. is when they go through that narrow part of the river that just mm -hmm. just shrunk down to just a few, two Couple yards across. And when it was like, you know, super wide because it goes like hundreds of feet down right there. Crazy. And then this, isn't this where they um, get some critters trying to swim yeah. up their Oof. wieners and stuff? Oof. <laughs> Just doesn't look good. What was that thing called? That river looks chunky. What was that thing called? The wiener worm? Kandiro or something? Or something the... like that. I have to look it back up. It's been a minute. Hmm. Anyway. All right, folks, we're just kind of, it's been a while. We're kind of uh, going back and forth on the book. I think we already read that part. I don't know. Anyway. All right, folks, we are, uh, we're going to wrap up this podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Tune into the next one. We get further into this story and see if they make it out alive or who does make it out alive. Obviously, Roosevelt. Someone makes it. Makes it. Yeah. And uh, thanks for supporting the show. Uh, check out all the coupon codes that we have below in the description field. And uh, use the code GRITTY. Appreciate you. Thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.